My dear uh, participants, dear uh, attendees, we are extremely honored today to see you so numerous for this cutting edge topic, and in particular for discussing with an exceptional panel how the metaverse becomes a challenge to classical intellectual property. Three of the best specialists in this very planet uh, to discuss about this topic. Three specialists uh, who have very, very different backgrounds. We have with us uh, Andres Guadamus, who is from uh, Costa Rica, and is uh, uh, an academic uh, in the United Kingdom, dedicates his uh, life uh, as a passion to uh, uh, the metaverse technology and its relation to intellectual property as well. And as such, he will be one of our panelists. We have with us, as well as the panelists, with Andres, we have Gregor Pryor, who works in uh, one of the most prestigious uh, companies working in this very field and uh, uh, legal teams working in this very field. And uh, uh, Gregor Pryor will also reflect how clients and consumers may be challenged by this activity. Uh, uh, by this, by this new uh, new range of services, of products, of opportunities uh, that really uh, make our world so exciting and challenging. Uh, Gregor Pryor is from the United Kingdom, and we have with us, as our keynote moderator, Michaela McDonald, who uh, is from uh, the Czech Republic and also uh, living in the United Kingdom from uh, uh, Queen Mary uh, uh, University London. She will be, uh, she dedicates as well her life as a passion to technology, which is uh, her main field of uh, teaching at Queen Mary, and she will uh, moderate our uh, debate today. So uh, with this exceptional uh, panel, I don't know if I should add many, many additional words. I would wish to thank all the uh, entities that permit this activity to be a pro bono activity, all the participants connected from all over the world, and also for their patience today due to the little uh, technical bug we had. I won't keep the floor longer. Enjoy this 21st digital encounter. Of course, after the encounter, we will publish a report on it, reviewed by your speakers and moderator. We will also uh, publish readings for those who want to learn more. We will continue this work over the years on these super challenging topics that really question all of us. Uh, I would leave now the floor to uh, Javier fernandez Laschetti, who is the coordinator of the Global Digital Encounter, uh, and uh, for his welcome words as well. Javier is, by the way, working also day and even day and night on the topic of the <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Laurent. Very, very shortly, because uh, we have to overcome the, the delay we had with uh, these technical problems. Welcome you uh, to, to our community again. And uh, well, this is a hot topic, and uh, that's why many, many of you have joined us. Uh, but it's also sort of hype, let's say. So that's why it is very important to have a uh, uh, people like we have today uh, from the academia, from the practice, in order to show us the IP implications of the of the metaverse. We are very, really happy. To, Just thanks to for have. kicking off the uh, discussion, the conversation. I think what we've experienced through these technical difficulties is um, one important point about the metaverse, and that it's about connection. It's about being in a space together, experiencing that space together in real time, um, no matter from uh, where you're coming from uh, all around the world. And as we can see, that is uh, not as easy to uh, deliver sometimes. Um, Gregor, uh, do you have an idea or a definition of uh, metaverse uh, just to set the scene for uh, for the discussion? Uh, thanks, Michaela. I can. Um... I can't see you, but I can hear you, and that's enough. Um, I, there are lots of um, conflicting views about what constitutes the metaverse. The most compelling one that I heard recently was that 
the metaverse exists when anybody spends more than half of their life looking at a screen. And if you think about our digital existence, you might argue many, many people already exist in the metaverse. I, I tend to agree with Andres about what we know as the metaverse today. I think the headsets are largely still a niche product. So I certainly agree with that. I think augmented reality is probably more likely if you look at what Snap has been doing over the years. Look at what Google's been doing. Those of us old enough to remember Google Glass, which was a deeply controversial product, but in the end had really good application. So I think the metaverse would be definitely a virtual world where users can interact and conduct activities as if they were in the real world. So that includes things like being entertained, commerce, meeting, community, all those other aspects that you might otherwise be able to enjoy in everyday life, you'd just be doing it on the screen. Within reason, obviously, there's only so much you can do in the screen. Thanks so much. From both definitions that you mentioned, what I'm hearing is a couple of sort of common features or characteristics, such as uh, it's quite realistic, immersive experience. Um, it is uh, ubiquitous, so you are able to um, access it or participate it through all sorts of digital devices, wearables, computers, headsets, VR, AR, and extended reality, and so on. Um, it is also um, interoperable, right? There isn't um, almost the, the metaverse doesn't have sort of um, multiple version of itself. It would or ideally it should be one space where we seamlessly move from one area to another, from one experience to another. And it should be scalable, uh, which means that the um, infrastructure, the architecture needs to be able to support uh, and deliver this immersive experience. Um, and that in itself can be quite uh, a challenge. Uh, given differences in different parts of the world in terms of these uh, capabilities. Now, uh, this leads me on to the next very quick uh, setting the scene question. And um, from what we've said, it already is clear that there will be very different versions or competing visions of the metaverse really depending on who is trying to build it, who is trying to sell it, or who's trying to use it. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about who do you think are the main players in this space that are shaping uh, the metaverse, the, the future of metaverse? Gregor, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Michaela. I mean, I think the obvious big player is is meta. So when I when when our team devised our paper, white paper on the metaverse, which you can download, um, Facebook was then called Facebook. And the level of investment that that business is putting into the metaverse is very real, but they're by no means the first metaverse company. I would say that you know the big players, Epic Games with Fortnite and other products and its Unreal Engine, you have Unity, uh, you, which is also a, a metaverse business. You have the two kind of, you have the decentral land, which I think is struggling to get traction, but definitely a big metaverse player sandbox, which isn't yet launched, but which has had huge investment. Um, and then companies like Roblox or Minecraft, which are mainly directed at gaming and children, but which are in the, in their own right metaverses. So there's not one metaverse, there's multiple uh, virtual worlds and you know to your point Michaela I don't think they're all hyper realistic certainly if you're in if you're in Fortnite that's not real life but it is a virtual world and I would also say you're interoperable there's almost the holy grail if you could take your character from Decentraland play a bit of Call of Duty then play a bit of Fortnite then go and do some shopping in uh, the sandbox that would be possibly a real metaverse, but at the moment you've got separate wall gardens. Ah, oh, we can see you now. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Gregor. Um, Andres, what is your view on the main players in the um, in the space? Is there someone that you'd add? Um, I I'll probably not go so much on the 
uh, on the companies, uh, Gregor has mentioned uh, most of the biggest players, but uh, I like to, to perhaps do a little bit more systematizing on the types of players, because I think that there, is a, there are three different visions based on, uh, uh, on who is uh, doing some developing. There is a lot of money going into this so from social media giants and, 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 and Meta that is betting the entire company, it look, looks like in, in, in this space, and lots of money from venture capitalists um, in, in this. But I would like to probably more uh, classify the players on how they're doing it, what type of metaverse they're building. So um, the most visible is the companies that have been mentioned, um, games companies and so also uh, social media, media giants like Facebook. Sorry, I should say Meta, but I, uh, uh, old habits die hard. Um, uh, these are creating private metaverses that are closed. As Gregor said, they're uh, walled gardens, right? They, oper they operate pretty much like a platform. In other words, like a 3D version of Facebook, you could think of it. However, there is a second group of uh, players uh, that are open metaverse developers. Um, I'm thinking of companies like Odyssey in the Netherlands that are trying to develop not so much the metaverse itself, they are developing some, some, some tools, but mostly standards. So open standards, open source standards, that decentralized standards that they can be hobbyists, but they also can be independent developers with some VC funding. And I think that this is actually a very interesting space uh, with quite vibrant uh, set of developers, in my opinion. And then there is a third number of players, uh, the so-called Web3 metaverse developers. And I think that they're trying to do um, an extension of the blockchain and NFT uh, space and put it into the metaverse. So we're talking uh, already uh, uh, mentioned the Decentraland, uh, companies like Axie Infinity. And the idea here is that property items are going to be able to be transferred using NFTs. Uh, we can discuss later about the viability of that. Thank you very much. Um, what you are both um, highlighting again is that it really very much depends on um, the definition or the vision of metaverse on who is delivering it. Uh, I think if I, as a user, imagine the kind of metaverse I'd like to inhabit, it's going to look very different than the kind of metaverse that, for example, Meta will be uh, offering to me as a as a digital product slash service. And uh, in terms of the issue of interoperability and how to achieve it and avoid walled gardens, that, that brings me to my next question, where we're getting really to the topic of, of today's discussion, and that's the role of intellectual property uh, law, intellectual property rights and metaverse. Um, I feel that uh, the concept itself is just going to further um, exacerbate the issues of digital ownership, interoperability, uh, portability that we are already experiencing in uh, lots of different um, digital environments obviously including uh, video games. So what is the um, relationship between metaverse and traditional intellectual property rights? Is there a working version of um, property, digital ownership uh, that you foresee could uh, address this somewhat difficult relationship uh, that uh, we've already uh, witnessing and experiencing on on daily basis, um, Andres. Okay, um, it's uh, this is really uh, such an interesting question. Um, for those of uh, us who were um, around the previous sort of hype cycle around the virtual worlds around two thousand six, two thousand seven. Um, 
We may remember that uh, some of these discussions were already part. Uh, I still remember people arguing about property in Second Life, and all of these companies were were jumping into Second Life, et cetera, et cetera. It's it's quite a fascinating subject. So I think that a lot of those discussions are still relevant. I sometimes joke that we're living uh, 2007 all over again, a little bit like um, the Wheel of Time or um, Groundhog Day, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, I, but I think that there may be a few interesting differences happening, again, sort of depending on what type of metaverse we're going to get. We may be getting all of these versions of metaverse, by the way, by the way and these are not exclusive. So if the property may actually end up being completely dependent on the type of uh, metaverse. So if we're thinking about the meta version of the metaverse, the the private companies, the games companies, uh, then the, com the the property is quite easy. Uh, they own everything. Um, they own the servers. They own uh, the, they uh, they bind you with the uh, end user license agreements, and uh, you do not own anything. This is your uh, version, with few exceptions. Uh, and Second Life was actually a bit of a, an exception on this. Um, most companies own all of the IP. And whenever they give you some property rights, it's mostly a licensing agreement. Um, sometimes uh, even trading on some goods is forbidden in the game, or you can do it only with the accepted channels. Okay, so you don't own anything in that version of the metaverse. Um, there is a second version of that is the, the more open, where the virtual goods uh, are, that are created by the user belongs to them. So this is really rare model. I mentioned Second Life because they were quite unique in this version. And um, whenever you created something in Second Life, and, and it still exists, people still use the, the platform. Um, they're very vocal in social media, uh, if you ever criticize Second Life, by the way. And um, it, it's interesting because uh, they license it with Creative Commons licenses. and. Um, the idea, uh, the third version is the idea behind the Web3 uh, blockchain and NFTs is that you are going to own everything that you create and you will be able to transfer it, port it, trade it uh, as a non-fungible token. And that is, those are the sort of the three property uh, ideas that are arising. So it's pretty much you own nothing or you own everything or you may be able to own something as a token in a wallet. I hope that's thanks. Enough. Thanks for your uh, for your overview, Andres. Um, Gregor, do you see the possibility of uh, a working model of digital ownership or property concept of property in, in metaverse coexisting with traditional modes of IP protection and uh, and management. What is your view on that? Yeah, I mean, it, certainly we get a lot of inbound questions from clients looking to protect. I mean, the sharp end of ownership is theft. So you know, in the digital world, you, know, you really know if you don't own something when someone else steals it. So, you, you know, certainly if you're if you're a brand uh, looking to protect your intellectual property in the metaverse and people are selling fake Gucci avatar handbags, for example, yeah, which is a re very real example. I think the beauty of the blockchain and NFTs, much as though, as Andre says, they are very hyped and the crypto winter might chill it a little bit, but you can you could certainly see this idea that digital ownership, if you look at the Beeple sale, you know, Christie's sold it for millions and millions of dollars. Now, did that transfer ownership? There's a whole question around the extent to which there's an assignment. Well, right. But you could see how people buy an NFT and think they own something. So I do think that there, if NFTs continue on their current trajectory, it's, it's almost Unconce inconceivable the regulators won't intervene because people clearly don't understand what they are and not getting when they buy an NFT. Do I think NFTs have utility and could enable ownership? Yeah, potentially, but there's a way to go. I think from what both of you have said, um, it seems to me that when we look at the relationship between metaverse and um, traditional modes of protecting and 
exploiting, managing IP, um, businesses will be okay. Intellectual property rights as they are will provide them with tools to ensure that their intellectual property assets are uh, protected, obviously, together with uh, contracts, license agreements and technological protection measures. But what about the users? Metaverse as a concept is based on the idea of uh, user creativity, of active engagement in the environment, of interactions, uh, the ability to create, share, consume within the environment. So how are the current intellectual property rights, the way they, they operate, how are they going to support that? Um, Andres. Um, oh, sorry, um, I had muted myself. Uh, I think that the, the scope for protection is pretty much going to be the same. Um, we already have protections that do not need to be overhauled on the metaverse. Uh, if you are a brand, you have trademark protection for hopefully you have uh, done all the uh, all the protection over your brands over your um uh your virtual spaces your uh, let's say all of the code is uh, under copyright etc also an interesting element that pe uh, people should start thinking about when we're thinking about the uh, traditional ip on the metaverse is people should start uh, buying um, I know it's, it may sound a little bit gimmicky, but they should uh, maybe start buying addresses on um, Web3 or Web3 uh, domain addresses. For example, I just I, I, I purchased uh, technolama.eth as a just just to keep it, just to, to make sure that uh, and technolama also a test uh, in in the Tesla's blockchain. Um, these are things that companies should start doing, even if it's going to be uh, proactive or defensively, they should be protecting the, their, their property on potential uses of the metaverse. So the protections that already exist, I think that they're solid, they're tested, there's nothing new under the sun in that respect. And I think that things like the courts have Managed to say that they are actually understanding the the environment, even so, though sometimes the judges need a little bit more of prodding. But there has to be a little bit of more proactive action, at least with the new tools. And I think the um, blockchain enabled uh, addresses, that your TES, your ETH, your whatever domain names, um, it would be a good idea for companies to start purchasing that if they haven't done it already, or someone else will do it for you and you'll have to pay a prime uh, afterwards. I'm conscious of the time. We have started a little late. So I'm going to ask last question and then open uh, the floor uh, questions from the audience. Um, as you discuss your visions and definitions of metaverse and um, concept of uh, digital ownership and property in metaverse, uh, you both uh, talked about the role that technology plays in um, supporting or delivering um, those experiences, uh, those uh, features and functionalities within uh, within Metaverse. You both mentioned blockchain, NFTs, and whether and how useful they can be for companies and users. I am interested in whether you think that technology technological solutions can, to some extent, um, replace or complement legal norms? And if so, in uh, in what context? Gregor, uh, you have mentioned the hype, the misunderstanding uh, about NFTs. People think that they are buying uh, property, that property rights are being transferred by virtue of purchasing NFT token. They are not. Um, so what is, how can we use technology meaningfully uh, to build metaverse with all these functionalities and yet make it clear they do not often uh, solve problems like the lack of uh, digital exhaustion or the lack of uh, working concept of, of digital ownership uh, in, in digital spaces? Yeah, I mean, What's interesting about your question, Michaela, is that 
most of the solutions to these type of problems tend to come from commerce and yeah, there won't be any kind of government or legislative initiative that would succeed in my view most of the metaverse environments are effectively walled gardens mm -hmm. so you have two sets of rules if you like you have the law and regulation which exists and if you are meta running a metaverse environment then you have to comply with the law you know child protection laws um you know copyright laws it, various intellectual property laws on top of those laws you then have the contractual rules which enable you to use an environment so if you are on a meta environment or if you're within an epic games environment or decentraland there are terms which apply I think technology can solve some of these issues when combined with terms of use and then you'll see an adoption. You'll see actually, OK, well, technology within a metaverse environment, perhaps you can own something and that something may have a value within that virtual world. I mean, the classic example are things that you earn using virtual currency in virtual environments. So I think that I think commerce will have the solution. It's definitely not going to come from lawmakers. Yeah, if you talk talk to them about the metaverse, their head spins. <laughs> Andres, how do you see it? Yeah, um, I I would agree that um, a lot of the at first, I don't think that there is quite a lot of need of regulation. I think that existing laws, as I was saying before, uh, are geared well. Uh, traditional cases are still useful. I am, however, going to, to be a little bit skeptical on the technological solutions, um, particularly a lot of the times things like smart contracts um, are presented as solutions or also governance structures like uh, DAOs, uh, decentralized autonomous organizations, which are organizations that are governed uh, through the means of smart contracts, um, that they could perhaps provide a uh, 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 an operational tool for the metaverse. I, I'm i sort of skeptical about that because I think DAOs have a lot of problems and I could talk for hours about this, uh, uh, a lot of the issues. And the idea is that we're going to be ruled by benign system of blockchains, which reminds me of this famous poem, watch over, all watched over by machines of loving grace. Uh, but the reality, reality tends to be a little bit messier. Uh, there are, as I was saying, there are lots of problems with smart contracts. Uh, sometimes there is an error in the code which can lock away funds. Uh, there is contract theft. Um, sometimes if there is a mistake, it opens up your uh, all of your apes to be stolen, for example, in the case of NFTs. Uh, if you uh, want uh, sort of to follow what's going on in this space, uh, there is an account called Web3 is going great, which is fa uh, fantastic in that respect. Uh, and the idea is also that when things go wrong, the companies are actually, these companies that are selling all of this decentralization are actually going back to the boring old law. To give you an example, just last week, Yuga Labs, who make the Board Ape Yacht Club, they sued a developer of a parody account uh, for, uh, uh, um, for trademark infringement. Um, so you cannot use a DAO to uh, to mediate uh, stuff like that. So NFTs have a future. I think that NFTs and smart contracts do have a future, but I think that um, we have to temper it with a little bit uh, of uh, uh, recognize that there are limits on this, um, and that's that's it. Thanks, Andres. I think it's a it's a really good point. I think in general we should be wary, based on uh, past experiences as well. Uh, about letting or um, allowing the private sphere to dictate uh, policies, including IP policies, instead of the legislators um, in the metaverse or anywhere else, uh, to be honest. Um, again, you have reflected on previous experiences of previous examples of Second Life, uh, you know, the whole discussion around cyberspace. It feels like we've been in this in this place uh, many times in the past. Um, and one last question before I open the floor to the audience. If you have um, anyone in the audience, if you have any questions for our speakers today, please do post them in the chat. Um, I'm not seeing any questions right now, so I'm going to ask another question. Um, 
And that is, do you think we will be able to learn from past experiences and mistakes that uh, have been made in terms of developing digital spaces um, in a way that they empower users, that they do not um, grant equally too much power to uh, private companies to regulate the space any way they want, um, and to enable the policymakers and regulators to really grasp and understand uh, the nature and the nuances of the space so that whatever laws and regulations are directed uh, at the metaverse, they actually work and they meet the initial objectives. I'm going to leave it up to you, uh, whichever of you would like to answer first, uh, whether you have uh, a hopeful message for us that uh, yes, we can learn from the past or you are more skeptical perhaps. I'm, I, uh, look, I'll start. I'm really hopeful. I think we are learning, right? So if you look at metaverse, I mean, the best examples are privacy, um, child protection. Um, when you look at how the law has developed in those ways, easy to apply to the metaverse, really easy. But you know, those laws hadn't really developed in the early advent of social media. So you're seeing that you know, as the laws around the internet develop, and they're naturally applicable to the metaverse. I think, yeah, I, I think regulation isn't the quantum leap that it was perhaps or would have been 10 years ago with the first second life. I think that was really difficult for regulators to get their heads around. So I'm, I am optimistic, yeah, but then I'm an optimistic person. So <laughs> Good to know, Gregor. Thank you. Andres? No, I'm, I'm also optimistic when it comes to regulation. I think that um, the spaces, um, companies have learned that there are, from from the spaces already, we, we have seen how difficult it is to moderate content, for example. And I think that that's something that uh, companies uh, already have some form of uh, experience. There is content moderation now is way, way, way better than it was. It's not perfect, but these companies have spent millions and millions, probably even billions of uh, uh, handling content regulation. Um, and I think that's actually one of the ways in which we are going to have to learn from the past, uh, because all uh, content moderation is going to be another of the biggest challenges that this com that uh, Metaverse is going to have. It's all about content moderation, because surprise, surprise, people are not very nice sometimes. I know uh, I'm, I'm also optimistic, but I've also been a gamer most of my adult life, and I know how uh, how bad people can, can be online. It is surprising how different people behave in online yeah. space yeah, when they absolutely. do the same thing in the real life, which I think, by the way, in a couple of years time, wouldn't really that, you know, distinction between real life and digital life will no longer mean much. We are getting some questions from the audience. Uh, so let me ask first one around uh, the issue of trademarks. Should owners of trademarks that are not reputed or well known be filing new trademarks for software and related services to be protected in the metaverse? So and how would you expect the uh, relevant offices, EU, IPO and so on, courts to deal with the similarity of real goods with the virtual version thereof? Gregor, can I direct this question at you? Yeah, hang on. It is one of the first questions from Thomas mm -hmm. Herbal. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a super question. Mm -hmm. I think you know, trademark offices getting their heads around you know, what's going to happen with um, software related services, specifically in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. And it really, again, the sharp end of this is going to be not the registration, but infringement. And mm -hmm. so you're really going to be companies are going to be reliant on good trademark agents to draft really strong, clear specifications, which perhaps are quite narrow and will make clear, hey, this is for the virtual version of what I'm doing. It's not for the handbag. It's not for the car. It's not for the it's not for the, the tangible. It's for the virtual. So I think there's going to be it's, it's going to be reliant on strong practitioners to kind of make the market here for this, I think. Thanks, Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally second that. I'm not, I'm a copyright lawyer. I'm, I'm not a, a trademark lawyer, but I know enough to just 
hurt myself and others. Um, it's it's going to be tricky. Um, I think that the, is going to rely on really good registration practices. I think here is an option for passing off to Shine as well. Uh, potentially, um, passing off has uh, the advantage that um, it you have to have a reputation, you have to have a brand. Maybe it's not exactly, absolutely, hundred percent the same registration. We've seen this case after case after case where someone is passing off their services as someone else. So I think that the metaverse is is going to be. It's passing off is already fantastic. I am a big believer in passing off, um, and I think this is this is their time to shine. Thanks, Andres. I have a next question for you, and that is about um, uh, the value of a property title, mm. authentication certificate delivered via smart contract in the blockchain according to intellectual property law. So um, if you have such um, authentication certificate, what is it that you actually have? From it's the IP law's view. It's a receipt of a receipt. It's a. It's not even a receipt. It's a link to a receipt. It's, it's, it's a receipt of a link that gives you access to where something may be stored. It may be on a decentralized service or maybe on a centralized service. I think that's as worth as much as you are willing to give it. Um, for example, there is not only one blockchain. There are different blockchains. There are. Uh, I have NFTs, I've curated NFTs in three different blockchains and are exactly the same thing. So whenever someone tells you that this is the one and only scars thing that they're trying to sell you as a certificate of authenticity, maybe they have the same version in three or four different blockchains that do not communicate with one another. So yeah, um, it's you have to trust. And this is the funny word. Uh, this is supposed to be a trustless system. But you end up having to trust people anyway. So we, we go back to trust. You have to trust the person that is issuing the certificate to actually be the person that is issuing the certificate. To give you an idea, I am the proud owner of the Nyan Cat NFT. I made an, a, an exact replica of the Nyan Cat. I have, I, I have uh, follow up questions on uh, NFT and property um, implications. Uh, when it comes to um, NFTs and so on. Uh, one is whether it is intellectual property rights infringement um, when you mint a work um, as, uh, as NFT without having any intellectual property rights in the original work. How much time do we have? I can. <laughs> for, I, I, I can. I can talk seconds. about this for hours. Uh, very briefly, I don't think that it. I don't think it's very simple. I think it's easier to make a trademark case on trademark infringement. There is a very good reason why Yoga Labs are not suing for copyright infringement. They're suing for trademark infringement, okay. um, because the, it's not settled that minting something without permission is infringing copyright. I Perfect. can. I, I can give you a. Or a long explanation of why, but yeah. Um, and following on that, and this is going to be addressed to Gregor, um, what do you think is the impact of recognizing NFTs as legal property by the UK um, High Court? Um, is this a useful uh, ruling that's going to clarify um, the legal implications of, of using NFTs or it's just going to complicate matters more? I think it depends if the rest of the world follows, right? Since Brexit, sadly, we've been more and more legally isolated, I'm sorry to say. So we don't, you know, it depends. You know, the, the internet thinks globally. I think often a, a court in a particular country taking the lead on an issue like this is useful, but really you need at least some resemblance of mm. harmony because unless you see that around the world, then you, you see one or two countries producing a fairly you know, I would say an anachronistic outcome. So mm. I do think the UK court is good at leading on these kinds of things. I do think our legislators tend to be quite forward thinking, but let's see what happens in the rest of the world, I think, especially America. Mm. Thank you very much. I have one more question that is slightly different from the other questions. I think something we haven't touched upon yet, and that is whether you think we are facing 
a conflict between digital society law, so laws that apply within the digital space, whether something like that exists, and the physical um, yeah. world legal system. So if you look at all the different norms that regulate behavior um, of people, it is the same people in the real world as they are then, you know, represented through the avatars in the in the virtual world. Do you think we are now having two different separate systems that are somehow yes. in, in conflict? Yes, I do. For a couple of reasons. One, because you know, metaverses have this wall garden where you have additional rules. And mm. if Meta, the company, wants to make a different rule in, in the metaverse, then they can make that and they mm. can kick you out if you don't like it. The other mm -hmm. thing that's interesting here is, you know, there's been a lot of fuss in America about whether if an avatar, one avatar assaulting another avatar constitutes mm. assault in the real world. Mm. And believe it or not, there are law firms that are selling their services to help recover your loss or damage if you are if your avatar is assaulted in Decentraland. I'm not making that up. That's true. <laughs> so you know, th there's an obvious conflict there. Is your is your avatar can your avatar be murdered? That was the other question that I was asked the other day. Could it be the case that you can have some cause of action? There's an obvious conflict there, and I think that's mm. only just going to continue. Mm. Andres, what, what are your views? There's a key, we, we clearly have many examples mm. where we see that actions in the digital world have implications mm. in the real world, and vice versa. Mm. Uh, do you think that these norms are really being consolidated into sort of almost two separate systems. I agree completely with, with Gregor here. Uh, there are two things emerging here. Uh, also, by the way, I, I, I don't like the concept of uh, avatar murder. As a, an avid PvP player, I murder avatars all the time. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, I, it's consensual, I, I'm guessing. They, they yeah, the watch out for American around. lawyers, Andres. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, I sometimes like to think about uh, end user license agreements as a constitution to the virtual space, to the metaverse space that you join. That is the con the almost like Aaron Clad constitution. You have to comply with this constitution or you get kicked out. It's going to be interesting. Um, back in the Second Life time, there was an attempt to be made to try to bring um, external property laws and concepts into Second Life. Uh, there was this person famously sued Linden Labs uh, because they had removed some of his property and he claimed that he had actually a property right over his, uh, uh, his land. So it's going to be interesting to see if we're going to see a rehash of something like that. Uh, but for, the, for now, I think that the companies pretty much operate in whatever way they want. It's, it is if it's a country, it's they are the kings of the gods of that country. I think we will we will see a shift in um, in thinking about this uh, topic as metaverse obviously takes up and and we all kind of slowly but surely uh, move our digital existence into whatever version will uh, be made available to us because. Obviously, these same questions have been asked with regards to video games. And there mm. was the beginning, I think, of uh, developing the video game industry. There was a very strong argument saying, well, these are just games, right? So mm. whoever makes those games, makes those rules, and you like them or you don't, and then you just leave, and there really isn't any remedy in the real world uh, when it comes to actions that take place within the game, a sort of magic circle. Uh, mm. But as we've seen, video games have become much more than just video games. And we are now talking about the sort of next level of immersive experience in metaverse, which clearly it's not just about entertainment. It is about everything else, all aspects of our lives. So I think the argument of saying, well, this is taking place in some kind of uh, make believe land or fantasy world, and therefore it doesn't matter or it doesn't have and there isn't sufficient connection with the real world is not going to uh, stand. And also from the perspective of these being digital products like services and users also being consumers, uh, there will be a big focus on 
actually delivering on what is being promised. So if metaverse providers are talking about property, they're talking about ownership, uh, they are specifying features and functionalities that the platform will deliver, they will mm. have to make it true. Uh, and this has to be then reflected in the license agreements, because otherwise then uh, this potentially would be a uh, matter for consumer protection law. I am conscious of the time. We have extended our session a little bit uh, beyond the original timing, and that was because the initial uh, connection issues, but we've overcome them even in Microsoft Teams, and we have managed to have a wonderful conversation. Thank you both uh, very much for uh, joining us today. And I believe I am handing over to Manuel to have um, a final closing remarks. So thanks very much, Lea Michaela. We do appreciate your skills as moderator, yeah. even, even uh, under such a complex troubles yeah and such a complex circumstances and we are very sorry we could not see you but only 15 minutes yeah so anyway it has been a wonderful discussion uh, in this discussion you three have opened the pandora box uh, of an extremely exciting topic my main conclusion is that we have to devote many more encounters to the metaverse in the future probably yeah so they are Andres and they are Gregor. Uh, we are also very grateful to you both. Uh, I believe we could have spent uh, at least one hour more moving from one issue to another, and we would, be, we would have been very happy listening to you. Uh, we have dealt with many questions. When we will read the report, you will be astonished. Yeah, but I, if I recall now, I just I just took some notes I, I have here. But for instance, we dealt with the with the definition of metaverse uh, as an ubiquitous, interoperable and stable space. Yeah, The different uh, versions and visions of metaverse, who are the main players, the need of achieving interoperability, the role of intellectual property in the metaverse. So what is the relation between the metaverse and the classic uh, intellectual property? I recall that Andres dealt with the three different concepts of property in the metaverse. How counterfeiting would uh, look like in the metaverse yeah. Yeah. and uh, how the blockchain is going to help there. If I recall well, it was Gregor who, who brought this issue. Uh, IP assets owned by businesses will be protected through licenses, but the issue is how the current IP rights are going to support users if i recall well was Michaela who, who dealt with this with this issue whether technological solutions will replace legal norms in the metaverse or not this is this is a, a, a hard topic uh, for a single uh, encounter in the future certainly and uh, you andres suggested that uh, the international organizations are going to jump into the matter in fact i see the european commission proposing at a certain point uh, nearby another regulation on this matter uh, there were many questions on how three marks are going to work in the metaverse you suggested also the issue of the of the passing off uh, what does it mean an infringement in the metaverse the potential conflict between the digital and the real world uh, which was brought by our dear professor leonel salazar from from venezuela so so many topics yeah all in all Nobody doubts that the exponential explosion of the metaverse is going to change our lives. When listening to you, I realize we're still far from identifying how many things are going to change in the IP world in the following years. So this is an issue certainly to be followed. So many thanks to all those who have attended the encounter, more than 200 today. Yeah. And many thanks to uh, all those who sent so many questions to the panel. We could not deal with all of them, but the questions will be answered by the panelists in written and will be we will publish then also the answers. So my dears, as you all know, the encounter takes just one hour and 10 minutes of the times of our attendance. So now, regrettably, it is time to close this 21st encounter. 
but uh, it is time to close it by recalling you that we will have our next encounter, so the 22nd encounter this September 2022. We will announce uh, the exact topic, the day, the hour, and, and the name of our speakers in the following days. So thanks very much. Thanks indeed to our speakers. Thanks to our moderators. Thanks to Fide and Tipsa. But today uh, I would like to give special thanks to Alvaro Arribas who had some bad time. Yeah, And uh, of course to all of you who have been today. Thank you for being so patient and for being so loyal to our encounters. And again and again, as it cannot be otherwise, we feel very close to all those people, all those persons who are suffering these days as a consequence of the war in Europe. We have them again and again and again in our minds. So my dears, take care and come again with us in a couple of months. Do count on all of you on our next encounter, the 22nd in September. Thanks for being with us and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Thanks, everyone.